Great. So again, hello, welcome to Finding Your Fit Customer Discovery. This is part two of a workshop series focused on customer discovery. And before we get started today, I want to take a few minutes to achieve a couple of things. One of those is orienting you to the functionality in Zoom so that you can be sure to be able to fully participate in today's session. This workshop is going to be really interactive. We're going to break out into small groups later in the session. And so I want to make sure that you feel really comfortable. So I want you to do two things. One is there's an icon called participants. Make sure that that's pulled up. This is where you can raise your hand to let me know that you have a question or a comment. The second is the chat function. This is the place where you can either message me directly to let me know that you have a question or comment, or you can ask a comment to everyone um, or ask a question to everyone and be able to generate some back and forth there with other participants. So those are features I'm going to ask you to use um, throughout the session today. I also want to get a chance to figure out who's with us today. So because we can't sit in one room and all see each other, I would like to understand who is here participating today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. I'd appreciate it if you can answer this question. I'm curious what role you're playing right now. Recognizing many of you wear many hats, if you could please pick the one that you think best represents you so that we can figure out who's with us today. Great, so let me share with you who's with us today. It looks like we have a graduate student. We have a number of you who are professionals in your day-to-day -day role. Perhaps you are pursuing entrepreneurship in addition to that role. And we have some of you who are full-time entrepreneurs. So, so glad to have you. Thanks so much for coming today. The next question I have for you is whether or not you were able to join us for workshop one. This will help me figure out how much we might need to go back and retrace some of our steps from last week and make sure everybody is prepared to be able to get value from today. So I'm gonna ask you to let me know whether or not you were able to join us last week for workshop one. It looks like we're split 50-50. So some of you were able to join us last week, which is great, and some of you were not. For those of you who were not able to join, if you registered for workshop one but were unable to join us live, we will be sending out the recording from workshop one so that you can be sure to go back and work on some of the work that those of us who were there um, achieved last week. For those of you who maybe did not register for workshop one but are joining us for workshop two, first of all, we're thrilled to have you. If you want to privately message me in the chat with your name and email, we will be sure to send out workshop one to you. Again, so you can go back and do some of that work once we've gotten through today. Great. All right. Well, okay, this is workshop series two, as you know, and so what the things that I want to be able to achieve are the following. We're going to think about the customer discovery process. For those of you who were a part of workshop one, we um, anticipate that you completed those five customer discovery interviews. That was our goal from last week. So we'll be interested to hear what you're learning along that journey. We're gonna take some time to reflect on what we've been discovering through that process. We're going to also think about how we might take that feedback, the information we're getting from customers as we go out and talk to them, and how that might impact our business model. So I'm gonna show you a tool today that's a really great iterative tool as you're out conducting your customer discovery to be able to modify as you go what a business uh, plan around that might look like. We're gonna focus some of our effort on thinking about value propositions. So one of the um, most um, important benefits of going out and actually talking to your customers is that you're beginning to understand what's really important to them. And you know you found sort of gold, you found a great alignment of your customer segment when it aligns with the value that you're able to deliver. And so we'll talk about how you can think about the value proposition that you can offer and finding the right fit with your customer. And then we're going to think about what it looks like for next steps. So for those of you who've started the journey, how do you continue on and continue to get value out of that process? For those of you who are joining us today and perhaps haven't started, we'll give you some goals to ensure that you're able to conduct really solid customer discovery. All right, so as a reminder, the reasons that we conduct customer discovery um, are paramount and hopefully we'll frame up why you're spending two hours with me um, through this process and hopefully many more hours on your own actually doing the work. So first, the reason is, as a reminder, you're not your customer. You may have come up with this idea because you are one of your customers, but you are an N of one. And so we wanna make sure that we really understand what our actual customers want from us, need from us, and how we can deliver that value. Two is in the earliest stages, when you are designing your business, when you have an idea and you're trying to create it into a product, and even when you're building a product 
or building multiple products, you really want to understand that your business is based on assumptions until you actually have paying customers and repeat customers. And so it's important that we spend some time figuring out what those assumptions are and then testing them. And as a reminder, customer discovery is one technique for being able to test and validate our hypotheses or assumptions. And that's a key part of de-risking your venture early on. Remember the goal of customer discovery is that this happens early in the process before you're spending your own personal time and capital on building up your product or service. You wanna really make sure you have that right product market fit. So that's why we're doing this. And again, it's an expensive process to get wrong. So again, we're trying to make sure that we do a lot of diligence on the front end to make sure that we can really accelerate and launch successfully on the back end. So that's why we're spending so much time working on this. Last week, we talked about a company called Sealed Air, and we used their product, Bubble Wrap, that they invented back in 1957 as almost a case study or an example of the importance of customer discovery. We talked about how when the inventors first came up with this product, they actually thought the problem they were solving was that they wanted an interesting wall covering. And it took them a number of years to figure out that this product and the features of the product actually really aligned with the customer segment focused on packaging and being able to safely ship equipment um, around the world. And so that took a lot of time. So we use that as an example of how we might be able to position ourselves to sort of quickly find that right product market fit. We also use the term product, uh, sorry, excuse me, market opportunity. This was the combination of our particular customer segment against the application or meaning the use case for our product. So in the case of the bubble wrap, what we talked about is there are many different attributes. It could function in many different ways. And one application is packaging materials. So how do you find the right customer segments um, in combination with that application. So hopefully that was a helpful exercise. Again, for those of you who weren't here, we'll get you the recording so you can walk through that process with us and figure out how we got to the point of being able to find the market opportunity and explore that particular customer segment. We also went through a customer discovery interview and sort of studied what that process should ideally look like. And one of the important features is being able to get out of the building. Um, in the case of being sheltered in place, we talked about the power of video conferencing and how for many of you, actually, your customers may be in some ways more available to you than they would have been otherwise because people are not traveling, they're not in in-person meetings, and we have a little bit more flexibility perhaps in our schedules when we're all working remotely. And so hopefully this will actually end up being a really advantageous time to make requests to individuals to have a video conference with them and be able to gain key insights by talking to them. We also talked about the importance of making sure that this is all about them, right? So this is not a conversation where you are selling your product and you're telling people about the many benefits you can offer. This is all about asking really good open-ended questions and letting the individuals you're talking to drive the conversation. So it's more of an exercise in listening than it is interviewing, actually, if you think about it. And so it's important that we practice that listening. And the goal was that we're disconfirming or proving out the assumptions. And so today, some of the time that we'll spend is trying to map the assumptions you came up with. Remember, these are the hypotheses underlying your business model against what you're hearing from your customers. And so being able to figure out, um, are they in alignment or are they disproving some of your hypotheses as you go out and talk to them? Really important. Um, and again, making sure that we're talking to the right customer segment. In terms of the customer discovery process, in week one, we focused on the first four steps, which were coming up with interview questions, finding our customers, thinking about sort of where they are, you know, what social media or other media outlets might connect them to us. We talked about tools like LinkedIn as one way of being able to build out our personal network and find individuals to talk to. We practiced our outreach methodology. We'll cover that again today. Um, just thinking about how do we make the right ask? How do we make people feel compelled to want to talk to us and share those insights with us? How do we portray ourselves as someone that's trying to learn um, rather than someone that's trying to sell? And then we talked about sort of the mechanisms of the interview. So that's what we did in week one. Today, what we're going to focus on is what we're starting to hear. So what are our customers telling us? How do we analyze that feedback that we're getting from them and put it to good use? 
It might mean that we want to adjust aspects of our business model or pivot perhaps as we go out and have more conversations. If we're feeling like there's a bit of a misalignment in terms of our value proposition and the customer segment who we thought was the right segment. So that's where we sometimes see pivots at this stage. And then again, this is a repeatable process. So this is something we anticipate you're doing both very early on and then continuously as your venture scales and grow. So really important. Um, and thank you again to those of us who were able to join us last week. All right, so today, for those of you who did conduct some customer discovery interview questions, I wanna walk us through how we can reflect on those experiences adapt our customer discovery process and be able to continue to gain value from having those conversations. So I have a couple of questions for, again, those of you who were able to complete the customer discovery process, or those of you who are in workshop one, even if you didn't get around to it, I still have some questions for you. So first, let me know how many customer discovery interviews you have conducted from last Tuesday to today. Don't count the ones before last Tuesday, just be honest. It's okay, I don't have names attached to your answers, so safe space. All right, I'm gonna stop us there and share the results with you. Thank you so much, first of all, for your honesty. It looks like there are people who did not have a chance to get in front of customers. We can talk about why that is. Perhaps you did your outreach and um, are struggling to have success, meaning that people maybe aren't responding to you, or aren't willing to put some time on the calendar with you, that's a challenge we're gonna talk about today. I see that some of you did between one or two interviews. That's fantastic. I can't wait to hear more about that. And some of you got three to four. So I'm really proud of everyone for the efforts that you put in. This is a process, okay? And so I'm gonna help you um, work through it today. So thank you so much. And then I have one last uh, question for you. Whether you have started customer discovery, um, as of last week or not. I'm curious whether or not you feel like you have found the right um, customer segment fit. So have you, do you feel like you know exactly who your customer segment is? Give me, a, give me a sense for where you're feeling right now. It looks like some of you have found it, which is excellent. And when we get to the point in time where we do some breakouts, for those of you who feel like you have found and validated your customer segment, I would encourage you to share with other participants what you've done to be able to find that. And it can be a combination of things. It may not just be customer discovery interviews. We talked last week that there are many mechanisms for de-risking your business early on. So perhaps you've pursued some of those other mechanisms. As a reminder, some of those were like observation or firsthand experience that makes us experts. So please share with us what worked. For those of you who haven't found it, I am still hopeful based on the limited number of customer discoveries it sounds like people have done, that these customer discovery interviews will really help you feel confident in moving forward, feeling like you have found that customer segment. Great, all right, that's all the polling that I'm gonna put you through today. So thank you so much for sharing your feedback. So kicking off today's workshop sort of officially and thinking about how we evaluate information that we are receiving while we're out conducting customer discovery interview, I wanna introduce you to a tool that I have found to be really helpful through this process. And this is called the Business Model Canvas. So we didn't invent this um, over um, in the right-hand corner, you can see the reference for where you can find this and other tools that these authors offer. But this is essentially a, I think of it sort of as your whiteboard for your um, creating your business um, model and being able to write a business plan eventually. These cells allow you to adapt really quickly to a changing environment or to a changing learning environment, meaning you may be at the stage where you're still trying to figure out all of these elements of your business. And so this tool can be a helpful place for you to jot down ideas and either make multiple business model canvas as you explore either different customer segments, perhaps you wanna pursue different revenue opportunities or revenue streams and you wanna create a different model, or you can put multiple pieces of information in here. For today's purposes, I really wanna focus on um, the two cells which are customer segment and value proposition. So first what I'd like to say is my recommendation for you is that you use one business model canvas per market opportunity. Again, the market opportunity is the, the combination of the customer segment and then the use case or the application. So if you are, have a technology or a product where you have sort of multiple use cases, again, let's take bubble wrap as an example. It could be a wall covering or it could be packaging material. Last week, someone suggested it could be clothing. 
those are each different market opportunities. And so I would say for every one of those you have, have a new business model canvas because there's too many moving parts to combine market opportunities. And with customer discovery, we want to go out and conduct discovery really focused on one market opportunity. So that makes sense to just sort of have it by that. And then what we're gonna really focus on um, through customer discovery is trying to align the value proposition with the customer segment. If you have more than one customer segment, let's say you have a two-sided platform, for example, the value proposition for one customer segment will be very different from the value proposition to the others. It's okay to have that on one business model. Sometimes I like to think about lining those up in rows so that it's really clear um, which ones go with which. I've also seen teams use things like color coding in this to work or even drawing lines on there, meaning that you're really making the connection between a particular customer segment and the value propositions that matter most to them. So this is a tool that we're gonna be using today throughout the workshop to help us really organize our thoughts around what we're hearing as we go through the customer discovery process. The other comment that I'll mention before we really dive into these two cells that I've commented today is that as you go out and have more of these conversations with your potential customer segments, listen for feedback that they're giving you that may inform other aspects of your business model. As you go out and talk to customers, they may talk to you about something that you need to capture on your key resources, meaning there is, are aspects of your business that you need to make sure are in place, whether it's sort of those um, key strategic partners that they mention, you know, maybe something like the American Heart Association is where your customer segment goes to get all of their information. You need to think about what resources you need to have in place in order to create partnerships with them. So they might be a key partner and there might be resources that need to connect. Maybe it's an API to their website, for example, or getting connected to information that they offer. So use this as a tool where you can also capture those key insights for your customers and build out other aspects as you go, even before you're technically exploring those different parts of your business model. People will share with you information that will be all about these different aspects of your business, capture them in these cells. And then finally, if you move on to explore different aspects of the business model canvas after customer discovery, so after we focus on value proposition and customer segments, you may wanna think about analogs. Analogs are other businesses that have similarities to what you're trying to build. So for example, if you're thinking about a particular revenue stream, or you're thinking about sort of how you're going to, your cost structure, how you're gonna make money, let's say you're trying to decide whether it's a subscription service or not, look for other similar businesses that might have that cost structure or that type of revenue stream who you can really study and understand how they built up a business model around it. So the information about this doesn't just come from your customers. I wanna be clear about that. It comes from many other places. Again, this is a tool to capture those early ideas. So let's first start by focusing on our customer segment cell. This is again, the whole point of going out and doing customer discovery is that we're really trying to understand who this is. So what I like to recommend to teams who are conducting customer discovery is after you've had somewhere between five and 10 conversations, it's really time to go back and reevaluate your uh, customer segment. Meaning at the earliest stage, I asked you pick a customer segment, really understand them, go out and talk to lots of them so that you understand them really deeply rather than understanding multiple customer segments on a very sort of surface level. Once you've had five or 10, you are at the point where you're starting to get an understanding or an initial understanding of that customer segment. And before you just continue on and have sort of 30, 50, 100 different conversations with that same person, it's time to ask yourself sort of the gut check. Do we start to think that this is the right potential customer segment? Have I had enough conversations that lead me to believe that I'm pointed in the right direction? Maybe I'm still trying to figure out whether I should talk to the VP or a director or a CEO. C-suite level person, but in general, I'm feeling like as I go out and talk to this group of individuals that I'm headed in the right track. Or maybe you've had a couple conversations where someone gave you feedback to make you think that actually maybe you're looking in the wrong spot. Sometimes what we have people say to us are things like, you know who might really like this, or that's interesting. I'm not sure that's a problem we've really thought about solving before. Statements like that should make you second guess whether or not you've found the right customer segment. And ideally, if you've heard that over, you know, somewhere again around five to 10 times, it's a bunch of people telling you that that's probably not the right market for you, or at least not the right market right now. 
So time to go back to the drawing board on that. Other questions you should be asking yourself are sort of like, where are the gaps that you need to understand? So if you've spent 10 conversations talking to, let's say, doctors, and you have no idea what other hospital administrators might want or how they make decisions, then you might want to say to yourself, all right, I have a pretty good sense for what providers or doctors are thinking right now about, you know, my, let's say, digital health platform but I have no idea how these actually get adopted into health systems. I have no idea who makes those decisions. I know doctors have lots of opinions about them, but I don't know and understand really how I might end up like actually getting my product into the hospital. This is the reevaluation where you should say, who do I actually need to be talking to? What are the questions I need to answer most fundamentally right now? Again, with the goal of de-risking your venture. So think about sort of where you're starting to see gaps. The other thing I would tell you is, are you starting to hear inconsistencies? This is again the point where you should be reevaluating who you're actually talking to. You may be telling yourself, I'm out talking to healthcare providers because they're my customer segment. But if you go back and look at those five individuals, you might actually see that that's not who you're talking to. Maybe you've talked to a cousin who was a pharma sales rep. Maybe you've talked to a neighbor who was a dentist. You know, there are times when we sort of like think we're in the general customer segment, but actually we haven't really talked to our customer. It takes a lot of work to get to them. I recognize that, but it's worth doing the work. So really put in the time and energy to make sure that you're talking to the right people. And that as you hear inconsistencies, you're sort of, again, going back and figuring out, are these inconsistencies truly representative of my customer segment? Or are they representative of the fact that I'm maybe actually talking to a couple different variations of a customer segment? And what I'm hearing is noise between the differences of a user, a buyer, an influencer, that type of thing. Sometimes at this point, after about five or 10 conversations, I'll have teams come to me and says, everyone agrees. Everyone wants this. Everyone thinks this is a problem. I don't know that this is worth continuing. Everybody thinks, you know, we need to be able to safely ship our packages. And my response to that is usually um, to ask to see their list of interview questions. It is important to validate that people like the problem that you're solving, care about the problem you're solving, have a need that you also want to help with. Um, but we need to get past that, right? What we're trying to understand ultimately is, will this group of people purchase and use our product? And will they want it enough that they're willing to pay for it? And getting a general consensus that you found an interesting problem isn't answering the question that people will pay for it. So again, make sure that if you hear a lot of agreement, you're asking yourselves, are you actually asking questions that get at the answer of whether or not they would ultimately use and pay for this product? Make sure you're not sort of staying at the surface level. If you go back and say to yourself, yeah, when I look at my customer questions, actually, I just really wanted to make sure that I was solving a pressing need that I was talking to the general right people. But when I go back and look at my notes, it really feels like I maybe didn't ask hard pressing questions enough. Like what would it take to adopt new technology? What is the biggest pain points in their current workflow? And what, you know, where could I play? What problems can I actually solve there? If that's the case, you've already formed a relationship with those people and you should absolutely feel ready and able to go back to them and say, gosh, that conversation was really helpful. That felt like we were just scratching the surface. I have a couple more specific questions based on your expertise that I'd love to ask you. Do you have you know, 10, 15 more minutes that we could jump on a phone call? Um, so use the people you've already talked to, even if you sort of feeling like I didn't go deep enough in those questions or I didn't sort of get at the right questions when we first talked. I'm seeing a question here where someone's asking me to talk about in a B2B model, the difference between customer segments and sales channels, and are they the same thing? They are not the same thing. So if we go back and look at our business model canvas, we'll see that there are um, different cells for these things. The channels are going to be the um, key mechanisms for actually getting your product to the individual. Um, and so those sales channels may be that you need to work with a sales team, it may be that there's a process in place where actually you don't sell to the end user, you sell to an aggregator or to a middle person. Um, that might be a sales channel. Your customer segments are again, the people who are actually making the purchasing decisions for your product. And I get a lot of questions sometimes about the difference between user versus customer segment. That can sometimes muddy the waters in terms of customer discovery. 
if you have the case where your product um, might be purchased by one person and used by someone else, I do recommend that you explore both of those segments, your user versus your buyer, um, just to understand again how they make decisions. You want your user to be satisfied with the product. You want your buyer to buy your product. So for your, if you're sort of starting at square one with customer discovery, I recommend that you talk to your um, buyer, the customer as the person who will actually be make, making the decision to buy and put money toward your product. That's the most important person, right? Ultimately, if they won't buy our product, then we have no business. When you are past the customer discovery phase, we validated that we have um, an important thing to offer, that we're solving a real problem, we know who we will ultimately be selling to, then you might transition into um, sort of user acceptance testing. You may move into that sort of product um, validation testing, and that's where you would get those user insights. So like, what are the specific features that they really care about? That should all come after you found the right product market fit. We talked a little bit about this in workshop one. So hopefully if um, you go back and listen to that, that will help you understand where this idea of customer discovery with your buyer and your payer really fits in versus that sort of downstream user feedback. That's also important, um, but should come later in the process. What I was building off of is that we're really trying to understand our customer. And what we wanna do, um, again, is have enough conversations to make sure we're on the right track, and then we wanna forge ahead. Again, we're trying to really understand the same type of customer segment as deeply as possible. And we talked about ways of creating what we call a customer archetype. And these are sort of characteristics of our customer segment that we probably now have hypotheses about and need to go out and test through customer discovery conversations. And we broke these down into sort of three different um, elements. We have demographic attributes, meaning you may have sort of a size of customer if you're a B2B model. You may have um, age of customer if you're a B2C. We want to think about sort of the typical title of our customer, who, again, who's making that purchasing decision. There also are going to be geographic attributes. So depending on your product or service, it rate may actually matter to you whether or not you're talking to um, businesses that are in an urban setting versus businesses that may be scattered all over the world and maybe perhaps more rural or suburban settings. And thinking about this is really important because the type of things that matter to a business in different geographic locations will be really important for you to understand for your business model. And that's why when you're out talking with people, you're getting warm introductions, which are fantastic. You're thinking about who's already in your network. It's always good to take advantage of that network, but be really strategic as you move forward in your customer discovery process, that you're just being mindful about who the actual segment you're talking to is. And that as you start to go out and talk to businesses that are you know, in Chicago, um, versus perhaps in another um, country in the world, you know, hearing those differences might mean that there are important nuances to those customer segments that may actually mean you should think about them differently. Or on the flip side, if you talk to, let's say, one academic medical center, they may have very similar feelings about how they adopt new technology, their willingness to try new things, their willingness to adopt new um, products or services. And that may actually be really consistent across all academic medical centers, but it probably means it's really different than that of sort of your private local health system um, or a health system that may be um, multiple, plate, multiple different um, entities that are scattered all around a state. So again, just recognizing like who are the people you're actually talking to and paying attention to differences that you may be picking up on as you go out and have conversations with them. And then we focus a lot on psychographic attributes. So again, these are like where the gold is, right? These are how do they make decisions? What do they value? What kind of behaviors should we come to expect from them? Because those are the things that are gonna be most critical for us in aligning our value proposition. We need to understand what they care about so we make sure that the value our company and product can offer actually aligns with that if we feel like we found the right customer segment. So the psychographic attributes are really important. So what I want you to do now, whether or not you have actually started your customer discovery process or not, is to either look at the list of people who you have interviewed or think about people who you plan to interview. And I want you to start comparing them. And so what I want you to be paying attention to is, you know, what similarities actually exist. If you've gone out and talked to five people, 
you know, are they all based in Chicago? Are they all based in rural settings? Are they all in small to medium sized businesses or are they all in large corporate entities? So what is similar about them? And if there are similarities, think about what themes are emerging from those interviews. Again, the goal is that the customer segment that we're studying, that we start to see themes emerge. And those themes will inform us on whether or not our assumptions around our business model are correct or not. So what I wanna do is give you about three minutes right now where you're gonna reflect on who you've talked to or who you plan to talk to and think about your sort of customer archetype. So what I've put on my post-it note here is examples of sort of a couple different bullet points that are starting to describe or illustrate my um, customer archetype. So if I go out and talk to individuals, you know, things I may begin to pick up from them um, or slash if I haven't started, hypotheses I have about them is that maybe they're pressed for time. They're, you know, multitasking. They have lots of responsibilities. I'm hearing that they always go to one or two people in the organization to make decisions and that that's happening at all the different businesses who I'm talking to. Maybe I'm starting to learn that they all have similar titles, something like director of procurement or director of purchasing. And so I'm starting to realize like that's who I need to be searching for um, on LinkedIn or that's who I'm looking for as I go to conferences and look at who the attendees are, the speakers. So I want to give you some time to do that. Um, I'm going to start that now. You've got about three minutes and then we'll circle back. And um, later today, you'll be able to share out some of what you found. All right, hopefully you've got a head start on jotting down your customer archetype. Again, this should be an evolving thing. So you should have assumptions now, again, about things that represent your customer segment, whether it's, you know, sort of psychographic attributes, where they're located, what age they are, um, things that matter most to them, and come back to these. These are really important. So as you expand your conversations and talk to more and more people, you should return to this um, theory of your customer archetype. Again, the better you come to understand who they are, the better you'll be able to position both your business and aspects of your business to align with that, as well as your sales pitch ultimately, which is what will matter. So thank you for spending a little bit of time thinking about that. The next thing that I want us to um, think about is the value propositions cell. So we just sort of focused on the customer segment cell, and I gave you some um, thoughts and suggestions for how you can continue to evaluate your customer segment as you go through the customer discovery process. Next, I want you to think about the value proposition. And so the value proposition are sort of the set of um, things that you are able to deliver to your customer that matter to them. And so some things that I like to have um, teams think about is both what value is important to their customers. So that's what you're trying to get out of the customer discovery interviews. But you also have to think about what actual values your product or your service is able to deliver. Those may not be the same and that's okay. Again, we're not gonna make everybody happy all the time, but we do wanna try to be clear on what value we can deliver and then finding the customer segment that sort of best matches up with that. Hopefully as you go out and talk to people with the customer segment you've selected, you will see the marriage of those things and those will start to align themselves. However, it's possible that um, it won't ever fully align, but you should try to find a sort of one or two values that you absolutely know you can deliver and that absolutely matter to your customer segment. That's really the fit that you're trying to find. So there are some different ways to think about value, right? There is quantitative value, meaning we can show that we are um, some percentage cheaper than existing options. We can show that something works faster. Those we can measure. So if you have measurable value, that's um, exceptional. And actually that would be really important for your messaging because hopefully that aligns with you know, key metrics that matter to your customer. Value can also be qualitative though. And so qualitative value, um, are really why you want to have these conversations because you can't measure it. You can't sort of send them a survey and ask for them to give you data back. It's all about sort of these feelings, the things that matter to them. Maybe they want generally, you know, better performance um, or they want something that satisfies more of their team members. They want to feel like they're contributing to something that has sort of broader social good. These may be qualitative but still important value propositions. And it's okay if your value proposition that your um, product or service offers isn't necessarily innovative in and of itself. 
I know that when we all think about, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation, we're thinking about sort of new things, um, new technology, things maybe we're not even thinking about right now that end up popping up in our lives and really mattering a lot to people. But very successful customers, or sorry, very successful companies often solve problems um, in a new way or in a way that is an incredibly significant to the customer. So this may be something like better performance. It may be a more customized or personal experience than currently exists. It may be more convenient than something that already exists. So we may be going into a convenience factor. There is, you know, sort of no um, wrong value proposition as long as you figure out what it is for your um, particular company and you make sure it matters to your customer segments in a way that they're willing to, again, pay for it, then you found your goal. So that's why we want to think about value proposition. When we came together last week, we talked about unveiling the assumptions behind our business model. So we were thinking about sort of what are the hypotheses that we have about how this business will operate, how we're going to bring about our product or service to the market and who it matters for. And those assumptions are what we're trying to test through the customer discovery conversations and the interviews we're having. Um, those assumptions are something that you should continue to evaluate but you can also begin to align them with your value proposition. So last week we were thinking about bubble wrap, of course, and we said, what if we think one assumption is that price is the most important factor when people are thinking about selecting packaging materials? That was an assumption. We created a question around it. We asked someone to tell us a story about the last time that they um, purchased new packaging materials and you know what was the most important factor to them when they were making a decision about what to buy. We were hoping that that question would help tell us whether or not price was truly the most important. Um, and so as we think about that um, from a business perspective, the way that we want to think about using that assumption is that if we think this is really important, what's the value we can deliver to be able to meet that important element? So can we have a product that's 30% cheaper? If that's something we can deliver and we prove that price is really important to people, again, we're finding the right alignment of what our customers want with the value that we're able to offer. So while you should also be testing your customer, your assumptions with your customers, also think about how that might impact the way you think about your product or services and how you think you can position yourself to be competitive in that space if we learn that this assumption is actually really important to our customer segment. So again, another example, we might say something like custom, we think that customers are really dissatisfied with the performance of the available products. And that might be something, again, that we're writing a couple interview questions to be able to test. And so when we're going out and asking those questions, if we think that's an assumption and hopefully we're hearing validation that that's true, we also want to think about how our product can make sure to capitalize on that fact that people are dissatisfied. So maybe one thing that we can work toward is by saying sort of our, you know, our actual product maintains its properties longer than existing solutions, meaning it will last longer, for example. And if we know that that's a value proposition we can deliver, and we know our customers are dissatisfied with the current performance, then we figured out that that's an important value to them. So again, figure out how to position your value against those assumptions that you're validating as you go out and talk to your customer segment. With that in mind, I now want you to think about your own value propositions. Again, for those of you who were with us last week, this is a point in time where I would encourage you to pull up that list of assumptions that we gave you some work time to think about last week. For those of you who weren't able to join us and are just starting off, the assumptions again are those underlying hypotheses around your business model. What do you think your customers care about? What do you think that they're struggling with? How important do you think this um, challenge is to them right now? Those, those assumptions or hypotheses are gonna be what you wanna draw from for this exercise. For those of you who have started customer discovery process, think about the assumptions that you're starting to hear are validated. Is it true that price is the most important factor? That's fantastic. How do we write a value proposition that speaks to that key need? You also want to think about what values that you can um, provide that align with sort of the needs, the wants, the problems that you're hearing from them. So what are people saying that you know actually you can help solve or address? So as they talk to you about their current problems, their workflows, their priorities, 
where can you fit in? Those are your value propositions. Those are for that customer segment, what's gonna matter most to them. This is sort of the building blocks of your future sales pitch. So using that value proposition cell of your business model canvas, I want you to start writing out what your value propositions are. And these statements should be about your product or technology or your service. And again, the value that you're able to bring. So I'm gonna give you three minutes to start working on that now. Fantastic. All right. Thank you for writing out your value propositions. Again, I would encourage you to come back to these. If you are at the early stages and you still have room to figure out or explore your own value propositions, this is really a time where you should figure out what matters most to your customers and focus on those aligning value propositions. If you're further along in your development process, your perhaps product already exists, or there's limitations in terms of what value your product can bring by nature of what it is, and you're really already sort of focused and honed in on what those value propositions are, that's also okay. Now your job is to try to figure out which customer segment wants those and needs those the most. And again, you'll do that by having your customer interviews and hearing from them whether or not the actual values you can deliver are of utmost importance to them. So great, thanks so much. All right, I want to pause here and see if anyone has any questions for me based on this work that we've done of using the business model canvas to think about our customer segment and our value proposition cells and using those as tools to help us in our customer discovery interview exploration. All right, I don't see any questions right now, so let's move on. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about troubleshooting the customer discovery process. And again, this is based on um, our Polsky Center experience, having coached teams through the customer discovery process and understanding areas where we have seen entrepreneurs and teams um, sometimes struggle in this process. So the three that I'm going to be covering that we think of as sort of common challenges that teams face that you may either be facing now or are soon to face as you continue your customer discovery journey is your outreach approach and sort of finding success with that approach, making sure that you're asking the right questions, that you're taking advantage of your time and the individual's time to ask the really important de-risking questions, and then being able to evaluate and unearth the really key insights from those conversations. So how do you sort of take a conversation and pull out the pieces that matter most from it? So first, in terms of evaluating your outreach approach, you should first reflect on sort of what your response rate is. As you go out and message individuals, as you get warm introductions from people in your network via email, perhaps you're messaging people on LinkedIn, maybe you're responding to someone on Twitter or on Facebook who has posted something that you think indicates they're one of your key customers who you would wanna to talk to through this process. Think about how many people are getting back to you. And there's a couple flavors that this can take. There can be the individuals who don't respond at all. That's sort of one group. There might be the individuals who respond positively, but don't necessarily ever end up securing a time to open up in their schedules to talk with you. Um, or maybe there's someone who is um, very interested, has talked with you, but something falls through, or during the conversation, actually they're not that easy to talk to, or they're not able to give you the information that you want. Those are all really unique challenges. I would say that for right now, hearing that most of you are very early in your customer discovery process, I wanna talk a lot about the outreach approach, some rules and best practices around that, and how you can make sure that your outreach is not a barrier to you actually having the conversations. For those of you who have already had success and talked to individuals, you should think about what about that process worked really well. Was it the way you positioned yourself? Was it the way that you clearly connected them to you and let them know sort of why you thought that they were the right person to talk to? Was your flattery approach really successful? Was it the fact that you had a great warm introduction from someone really influential? So again, what was it that worked really well and how do you repeat that? Um, for some of you, you may also should um, evaluate whether or not the people who you've already talked to are already in your network. And the reason I wanna think about this is one, because we wanna control for bias. As we talked about last week, people who are closest to us love us the most and want us to be right. 
and want to support us. And so they're very likely to give you the answers that you want to hear and the information that they think you're looking for. As you get further and further out in terms of your own personal network, hopefully people will be more willing to be transparent with you. And ideally you've set up your questions to be able to solicit um, real feedback from them. Again, open-ended questions are really important to making sure people are sharing with you their genuine feedback on a particular topic. So sometimes we see teams that have a lot of success early on, maybe those interviews five through 10, because they're using their personal network and for many of you, you have a very strong personal network and lots of people who are your customers and would be willing to talk with you. And as you start to sort of get further and further out from those individuals, you may start seeing challenges in terms of finding individuals who are willing to talk with you. And so again, that's all about how do you transition? Maybe you were using your personal network and so all you had to say was, you know, hey, Jill, we you know, haven't connected in a couple months, but you're such an expert in this space. Let's jump on a call and maybe Jill's but um, you should also be thinking about how you might change your approach when the individual is not in your network. So as a reminder, last week I gave you a suggested outreach format. Again, this is not um, a hard and fast rule, but it's just some general things that you should think about including in your outreach messaging to individuals who you're asking to speak with as part of your customer discovery process. And the things that I think are most important here are that you are brief, first and foremost, because no one's going to read a long email, um, that you make sure to personalize it. So the individual should know why you guys are connected. So what do you either share in common? Who do you both know? Who referred you to them? What did you read of theirs or see in their profile that made you think that they would be the expert? Um, and then what particularly you want to talk about. So it is important to be pretty specific in the topic you want to um, get their input on. Again, hoping that you found a real um, shared interest in this topic. So people will want to know exactly what you want from them when they're agreeing to spend some time with you because we're trying to evaluate how to fit this into our busy calendar. Um, and then the third thing is make it really easy for them. So we talked about using tools like either suggesting a couple of times when they could jump on a call, video conference with you, using a tool that allows them to book time with you immediately there in that same outreach, trying to avoid that back and forth that can sometimes lead to drop off. So make that call to action, what they need to do next, really easy and clear for them. So those are some outreach approaches um, that I just recommend that you reflect on. When we do some breakout rooms in just a little bit, I would also encourage you to share with others what has worked or what challenges you're facing in that outreach process. The second thing that we see um, teams sometimes needing to really refocus on is thinking about whether or not you're asking the right questions. So you maybe started with a question list. You hopefully used your assumptions to figure out what questions are most important to ask in order to prove or disprove those assumptions. But now is the time to sort of go back and look at those questions. Are there any questions that people like really struggle to answer? Are there any questions where people are giving you simple sort of like yes, no answers, or it's a little too binary and they're not sort of expanding on it? Or is there a second follow-up question you could ask that would allow them to sort of continue talking about something that you see people, you know, maybe being willing to talk about, but your questions aren't actually like deriving the right information? So really making sure that you're thoughtful about how you phrase questions. This is something that you're going to learn as you practice. So again, the more conversations you have, the more adept you'll get at phrasing questions correctly, figuring out the timing of questions, and figuring out which questions are most important to fit into those really brief, you know, 20, 30 minute conversations that you're having. Then we start to hear sometimes from people that they're hearing the same information over and over again. And um, I would push back on that a little bit, which is again, look at your questions and make sure that you're asking the right questions. Sometimes people, you know, repeatedly sharing the same information with you is in fact validating that you have found a really interesting product market fit or that a value proposition um, is really important to your customer segment. But depending on how you're asking it, it may be just the fact that, of course, everyone is going to say that they want to support the environment, right? And so you're, if you're asking them a question that's something like, well, how important is the environment to you? as you think about your business, everyone's gonna say the environment is important. We all live on this earth. We all have beating hearts and care about the health and well-being of it. Um, so really make sure that you're sort of like asking the right questions. And there are many different ways of trying to get at that. So think about rephrasing those individual questions. 
You also want, may want to think about your questions in um, a pain and gain format. And what I mean by that is look at your mix of questions and see if you're testing both pain points as well as gain points. So when we talk about pain points, you know, you may be wanting to think about asking questions to figure out like what are their biggest risks, what's most frustrating to them, what problems keep them up at night, you know, what's stopping them from actually doing the work that they want to do or know they need to do, what's taking up the most time but has the least amount of value. These are not exactly how you might want to phrase the questions, but these are again getting at like pain points and trying to figure out can your product or service um, actually help solve these problems that they're um, experiencing and the right questions can help you understand both like do they have the problem and is it important enough that they would be willing to buy um, and adopt your actual solution so really important to think about sort of pain points gain so your gain points are sort of the flip side of that so thinking about like more aspirational things you know, what are their goals that they're trying to achieve? How is success measured in their organization? Um, what have they actually tried that they think paid off? What was it about that that made it pay off? You know, asking people for prior experiences or prior behaviors or stories is a good way of understanding both how they make decisions and again, what's important to them. Because ultimately, if they've paid for a product in the past, it's because they believed at the time, and maybe they still believe, that it's in solving an important need or bringing an important value. And so if you can understand what those pain points are or those value points, you can really try to align your product to those exact points. You may ask them questions about their competitors. So, you know, what are they doing that, that their organization wishes they could mimic or what trends really interest them that they want to be a part of in case you're trying to meet sort of like an emerging need or something that's, you know, just up and coming in terms of your particular market. So just some ideas. Again, pain game can be a great way of trying to structure the interview to make sure that you're validating your own value propositions. The third thing that we see people struggle with is making sure that they're actually finding insights in these conversations. So yes, you need to go out and have the conversations. That's so important. It's a, been a huge part of what we've been talking about is getting in front of those people. And that has value in and of itself. But we want to make sure that you're actually getting all of the value out of those conversations since you're investing your own time in the outreach process, which is long and lengthy, and in the interview process, which is also time consuming. So where possible, I recommend interviewing in pairs. This will allow one person to drive the conversation and sort of be engaged and watching for nonverbal feedback from the individual, taking cues from them. And the second person can be capturing really great notes. Sometimes we get the question um, from individuals like, can I record the interview? And I would just say that there um, can be a time and a place where that's appropriate. However, many people will um, maybe be more hesitant to share openly if they know it's being recorded. And so it's a bit of a double-edged sword there where yes, it would allow you to truly capture the entire conversation, but you might wanna consider like what you might be losing um, if you choose to go that direction. So either way, really focus on taking good notes during the call. And then I recommend that after the call, you try to save yourself, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes where you can really continue to write. This is sort of like a journaling exercise. So not only were you recording quick answers as they talked during the conversation, but after the fact, really think about it. Think about that conversation. What stood out to you? Was there something you've heard over and over again that you feel like is exciting? Was there a new insight or something that confused you that they said that you want to go think more about or dig in with another person on? And so this is really just an exercise of stopping thinking and reflecting. And it's important that you think about what was actually said rather than what you wanted to hear or think you heard. So again, words are really important and the person is going to be communicating with you. And I want to make sure that you're not getting in your own way. Um, by sort of jumping to a conclusion. So really think about and study carefully the words they use, the stories they told you, you know, there's meaning behind all of it. And so make sure that you're really being methodical um, when you're analyzing what was said. And then pay attention to those stories shared. So we talked last week about the importance of storytelling and that when someone shares with you an example or a story of what happened, that can sometimes be more revealing than them projecting or um, pretending to guess how they might act in the future. So past behavior is super important to understanding your customers. So where there are stories, you know, think about what the underlying um, sentiments were 
you know, what drove them, what were the decision factors, who did they work with, who did they turn to, all of those key things are going to be really important for you. So take time, um, don't just blaze through the interviews and then stop there. Really good work can happen after the fact. All right, so let me pause here. I've just talked to you for a full hour. Hopefully this is helpful information. I would love for in the next um, 30 minutes or so for the, all of you to get to engage with one another. I think some of the best um, learnings happen when we share with each other what has worked and more importantly, perhaps what challenges we're facing or what isn't working. So I'm going to at this point divide everybody up into breakout rooms. And um, this is a chance for you to engage with other individuals who are in the workshop with you. So I'm going to um, break us into this. There are gonna be about five people in each of your work um, breakout rooms. We're gonna spend 10 minutes and then we'll come back together at the end. Myself and my colleague, Chrissy Ritter, will be bouncing around between rooms to help facilitate the conversation. Let me show you what I want for you to talk about when you're in the room before I break you up into these rooms. I want you to first start by introducing yourselves. Keep it super brief. So um, really fast, give us your name, your role. You can talk about either your sort of product or service that you are working on. Um, again, super brief. We don't need to be experts in it. And then the customer segment that you're either currently interviewing or planning on interviewing. And once everyone's introduced themselves, I want you to talk about what challenges you might be facing. If you've had successes, share what worked. And then as a group, pick someone who's gonna capture questions that came up for the group so that we can raise those when we reconvene in 10 minutes. Thank you. I wanna make sure that you think about how to continue your customer discovery journey, even after these two workshops. So a couple of goals that I've set for you based on, again, experiences of running customer discovery courses um, for other entrepreneurs is that you should think about setting a goal of reaching out to 100 ind individuals uh, requesting some customer discovery conversations. And this is with the goal in mind that you want to have the somewhere between 30, maybe 30 to 50 customer discovery interview conversations. Um, unfortunately, time and time again, we have seen that it takes quite a number of outreach um, attempts to be able to get a return on that investment in terms of securing an interview. And so you should anticipate that you will have to um, reach out to a large number of people in order to meet that 30 to 50 goal that we have for you. And we came up with the 30 to 50 goal because what we've seen is that by talking to roughly that many individuals in a similar role or in a similar segment, you should at that point really begin to have validation of your key assumptions, meaning that you should hear enough similar sentiments to either prove or disprove that assumption. And by no means does that mean your customer discovery um, process is over. It just means that that should be enough conversations for you to make some um, well um, thought out and well exercised business assumptions and move into your business model canvas with confidence. So again, this is all about de-risking by testing those hypotheses through conversations. Continue to capture notes. Use those throughout your journey as you build out your business model. You should, um, at that point, feel really confident in talking with investors, with key partners, and with other individuals. And I can tell you that having actually performed customer discovery conversations and had conversations with your customer segment, with key stakeholders, with users, will really set you up for success in terms of being able to convince other people that you have the right business model in mind. You've validated parts of it. You, this will set you apart from many other entrepreneurs who are not necessarily taking the time to validate all of these assumptions. So really worth the work. And I, like I said, the first session watched this transform a number of ventures by actually going out and doing this really important diligence work on the earlier side. Um, so use that business model canvas. Again, this is from um, a book called Business Model Generation. It's a great, um, easy, beautiful, well-designed read in case you're looking for other resources. And um, in terms of resources, some other books that I recommended last time um, that I'll recommend again along the customer discovery journey are listed here. Um, the first session we used this book, Where to Play, again, when we're trying to think about evaluating market opportunities. So if you're at the stage where you're still trying to figure out um, which opportunity you want to pursue, which customer segment to explore, um, that's a really great tool. But there's a number of great books here 
Um, if you have any questions for me about the content here, um, you are welcome to email me. I would also encourage you to take what you're learning throughout your customer discovery interview process and consider talking with some of the mentors that are brought into the Polsky Center. If you are registered as a Polsky Center Exchange member, which is an opt-in model, every Tuesday we send out um, links where you can go ahead and sign up for time with the mentors. These are great individuals where you can bring findings, bring these challenges to talk to them about what you're learning with your customer discovery process. So another tool for you along your journey that I hope you're taking advantage of. It um, has been great to spend the last hour and a half with you. Again, congratulations to all of you for actually taking time to do this work. It is work and it is um, particularly challenging when you're sheltering in place, but I'm hoping that you can use this time to really dig into your customer segment and have these conversations and feel super confident about your business model moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna close today's session. I will stick around in case you have any follow-up questions on chat. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you at a future event. Have a good one.